Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. This is episode five with the legendary Dr. Adam Back. We're going to be discussing his brainchild, Sidechains. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Back. Hi, thank you for the uh, illustrious uh, introduction there. <laughs> well, I don't know who else would be more legendary than you, perhaps Satoshi, but maybe you are him. Uh, but anyways, let's get let's get into sidechains. What exactly uh, are these sidechains, and why are they going to be important for extensifying and developing out Bitcoin? Right, so once you start sort of digging into Bitcoin and learning about how it works and how the development process works, you realize that it's, um, you know, while there's a quite rapid pace of development, it's generally focused on security and core features that are needed to move it forward. And there is a wider community of people who are interested to try out all kinds of additional extensions and fun ideas that they would, would want to, you know, put in front of users and see if they would gain adoption. And everyone's got their pet project. Right. And, and, you know, even, even within Bitcoin itself, there's a kind of informal uh, wish list. And I think uh, Greg Maxwell has a, a, a page on the Bitcoin wiki with you know, dozens and dozens of very interesting and innovative ideas that could be potentially integrated into Bitcoin. But, you know, there is only, only so much development bandwidth. There's only so much quality assurance bandwidth. Bitcoin has a very strong focus on quality assurance in a very rigorous way because of the amount of money involved. And well, we got billions of dollars at stake, right. and there is n- literally no margin for error. Exactly. Usually, yeah. when we're deploying crypto systems, there's a margin for error. You can build in additional safeguards in case one safeguard fails. But in Bitcoin's case, there right. is no margin for error. Period. Right. So it's one of the most high assurance kind of uh, software projects on the planet right now. I mean, people, the closest analogy people like to talk about is upgrading the uh, flight control system on a super jumbo. I'm sure everybody's heard that particular one, and it's kind of apt, in fact, unfortunately. Yeah, except we're, we're not just upgrading the system on one super jumbo. We're upgrading it on all the super jumbos all while they're in the air. Yeah. And, I mean, you upgrade it the wrong way, and we've got tens of thousands of people in the ocean <laughs> or yeah. wherever <laughs> or, or in bitcoin's case billions and billions of other people's money poof yes confidence so, gone so now and, and we've seen it happen before mike hearn's very first commit to bitcoin uh hard forked the network and there was a drop in the price of 30 to 40 percent within a, a, an hour or two so i mean it's very serious what we're talking about yeah i mean i think people like to qualify that in a sense that it wasn't foreseen that, that a fork would arise from that and it, it passed the kind of security review so nobody foresaw it and it was kind of a subtle problem so I wouldn't like to point the finger at Mike but it, nevertheless it was it was a kind of scary moment for Bitcoin and the technical community had to react very quickly and actually if you if you go look online there's an analysis done more recently by yeah it's like a play by play yeah it's <laughs> kind of fun uh, by this guy uh, Dr. Arvind Narayanan and He's kind of analyzed how the community kind of debugged it and fixed the security very rapidly. So it's kind of illustration that, you know, people like to think of Bitcoin as uh, anti-fragile, as Ant- uh, Antonopoulos has coined this kind of phrase as it applies to Bitcoin. But um, the kind of day-to-day reality of it is there are some extremely smart and very quick to react uh, experts who are monitoring the system and fixing issues as they arrive. And some of those fixes require careful analysis and security planning over extended periods of time as well that the public is generally not necessarily aware of until they're published. So the recent BIP66 uh, deployment actually had a quite big security defect that was fixed 
within its rollout that was subsequently released by uh, Dr. Peter Waller. Um, and there's a, a CVE report now about the security defect there, so people can see what what was going on behind the scenes. And that was a that was a security defect that could have affected every Bitcoin user. Yeah, so I mean, it it, it depends on like you know the the exact uh, details of how people are using it and that kind of thing. But it was a pretty serious defect that got fixed right there. You know, if if it was generally known about, it could have been exploited in a kind of proactive way. And the fact that you know we can see in the network that. Basically, nobody else was aware of it, or the people that were aware of it didn't exploit it because you would see evidence of this in the blockchain. So you and Dr. Peter Woolley and Greg Maxwell kept your yap shop. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, beyond myself being kind of peripherally aware that they were the core developers were working on something, I actually intentionally abstained from knowing the details because it's a kind of responsibility, right? You you don't like you know it's it's, it's having knowledge of a very high value secret, so. I, I didn't want to know yeah. until she was <laughs> <laughs> intentionally ignorant. Yeah, and uh, there are a few other people who took the same approach, actually. So I know uh, Peter Todd had mentioned the same same kind of thing. That he didn't want to know about the details beyond, okay, I trust you guys. You're working on it. You'll be rigorous and, and fix it in the best way. But uh, the information should stay closed until it's... <laughs> so the, the Bitcoin guardians, uh, there are guardians there. They're trusted with the very foundational parts of Bitcoin. And, and in this case, they could have abused that trust and they didn't. Right. You know? Yes, it's true. Yeah. I mean, how would side chains help alleviate some of this pressure that that's a, cause I mean, think of the weight on the shoulders. You're, you're just waiting for BIP 66 to finally get up, uptake by the, uh, by the network and get rolled out. That's a very heavy weight on some of these individuals. You yourself refused from, uh, knowing the exact details of the weight. You didn't want to shoulder that burden. Right. Uh, how, do, how can side chains help alleviate some of that weight, some of that burden? Uh, on our core developers in the development process. So, uh, as we were saying just a moment ago, the, there are many features people would like to implement, and if it was a free for all and everybody was checking in their features, the risks would increase. You know, so there just wouldn't be adequate testing and review done. Yeah, and and I mean, it's just it's just software complexity. I mean, Bitcoin is a very complex system at the kind of leading edge of human capacity to manage the complexity and security assurance of. And so what, what you normally want to do in software systems is to add modularity and to sort of have security boundaries and assurances between them. So what sidechains do is they give a way to extend Bitcoin, so to add new features to Bitcoin, but do it in a, in a modular way. So there's a separate chain. So you've got the Bitcoin main chain and then you set up a sidechain. So. With, with the company I co-founded with Gregory Maxwell and Peter Waller and uh, some other Bitcoin contributors and developers, we released the first version of the sidechain. It's called Sidechain Alpha some months ago. And the way that works is the there's this alpha sidechain and there's the main Bitcoin chain. And there's, there's a kind of very rigid security boundary between them. So you can move Bitcoins from the main chain into the sidechain and you can move the Bitcoins back out again. But if a security defect were to arise in the alpha sidechain, there's uh, basically no way that that could affect ownership within the main Bitcoin chain. So that gives a, a very strong security boundary to build some new software through various stages of development. So it can start at an alpha stage, go into a beta, and then go into a kind of you know 1.0 robust stage of deployment. And so you can try some quite novel things, as we did. I mean, we released this uh, confidential transaction feature that we talked about in a previous episode and that would have been very challenging to do with to do in bitcoin directly and it was actually the interest to be able to deploy features like that you know that was proposed back in 2013 and i found that the appetite to include such advanced features directly in bitcoin was hesitant because of the security sort of balance that we just discussed so that was kind of what, what led me to go and focus on how, how one could more modularly extend Bitcoin. And so the sidechain, sidechain idea was a kind of combination of ideas by myself and Gregory Maxwell. And you know, once, once we came up with the idea that you, you should be able to extend Bitcoin, it's an open framework for extending Bitcoin. Other individuals or companies can, you know, make their own sidechains with completely novel insides. There's a 
you know, an API or boundary for how you move Bitcoins in and out of it. But once you're inside it, you could essentially rewrite it in a completely novel architecture. You know, you could have a sidechain with zero cache in it, which has a much different ledger structure where, you know, there are all kinds of zero knowledge proofs governing ownership and not a visible ledger. Uh, you could change a smart contracting language. You could have proof of stake. Uh, yes, you could make it a permissioned blockchain. Right. I mean, potentially you you could do proof of stake. You you might need a, a bridging mechanism to do that, but it, that also is possible. So it really opens the scope. You know, it's it's quite free form. You can do basically whatever you want inside there, and you know, people's trust of your particular sidechain should come down to you know. Well, uh, how competent are you? Who's reviewed it? What kind of uh, quality assurance bar is there? So people who put money into it, put Bitcoins into it, or do financial transactions in it with other kinds of assets that are now supported in it, uh, they should pay attention to the, the assurances and competence of the people who are developing it. But at least it opens it up so we can see potentially a much more rapid internet pace uh, development of new adventurous features and some very interesting things may come out of that so how does the sidechain actually work are we putting something into the off return on bitcoin are we creating a smart contract i mean how how's like how does it actually work or function so let's let's start with a, a a simple version so what you do basically is you take some bitcoins on the main bitcoin chain and you suspend them by sending them to a special smart contract, which uh, handles sus- suspending Bitcoins. And in order to do so, and, so you do that. And which features in Bitcoin do okay. we use to so, do that? So to do that, the Bitcoin smart contracting language is a general programming language, but some of the operation codes were disabled historically for security reasons, and there are some limits. And it appears to be not, not quite possible or not efficient to implement the suspend feature directly in Bitcoin scripts. So there's a need to add a feature to enable that, which is soft forkable. So it's, you can upgrade, you can add it in a backwards compatible way. And there's discussion of how, how that might, the mechanism, how that might happen. And so once you've suspended the Bitcoins, you present the proof of suspension to the sidechain and the sidechain grants you the equivalent number of Bitcoins on the sidechain. So the effect is as if you've moved the Bitcoins from one chain to another. And then you use them in the sidechain, and maybe the sidechain has you know, a different smart contracting language or support for, as the alpha sidechain has, you know, confidential transactions so you can hide the values or uh, native tracking of shares and bonds and fiat currency, whatever assets people want and, to issue. And eventually, could we see sidechains that are specialized and perhaps have uh, limited programming ability where one might be focused on rewards programs, you know, for frequent flyer miles or yep. rental car systems, or and then we might have another sidechain that's focused for high-frequency trading or another one for bonds and stock issuances. Sure. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that's the idea that, that you would have sidechains that fulfill specific purposes. I mean, generally speaking for... Are, uh, are they going to be interoperable? Where, yes. Will... will uh, Will it be possible to trade your your delta frequent fire miles that are on the delta side chain? That's a side chain to the uh, the credit card or the rewards points chain. Be able to trade those frequent fire miles or use them as collateral against an insurance contract, for example, or, yeah, or so, to pay for shares of stock that right. are on a different side chain. So it's it's that's that's the idea basically. So side chains and the, and the, so we've we've talked about how you can move bitcoins from the main chain into the side chain and you can move them back by doing something called a proof of burn and you you provide the proof of burn back to the bitcoin chain and that allows it to unsuspend and let your coins move move around within the bitcoin chain again. So that kind of completes the loop there. But that same mechanism can work between side chains. So, you know, a given side chain may be tracking US dollars or rewards points and allow trading of those things or writing of smart contracts to create financial instruments like derivatives and structured products. But those, even the, the assets issued on a smart chain, on, on a, on a side chain can be moved to another side chain. And even the smart contract constructive, constructed products can be moved between side chains. And so you could, you know, write a smart contract on one chain that involves Bitcoin and US dollars and some kind of derivative, move it to another side chain, and then use that 
instrument as a building block to build a structured product or some other kind of product. So the sidechain is really, you know, uh, a sort of inter-networking mechanism between chains. So it's a way for people to interoperate. And, you know, the financial system is very interconnected. And the, the blockchain technology is all about automating real-time audits and reducing trust, place, removing trust from the issuer of a financial product to the product itself in a kind of covered product sense. So for that to make sense, you know, if, if different institutions are using different chains or sharing chains, you need to be able to transfer the trust between chains. And so, you know, if you, if you have systems with, which are using incompatible blockchains, it will start to become a problem because you'll lose the trust assurances every time you move between chains. So you really need a kind of standardized trust transferring inter-networking model. And that's what sidechains provide. Which would be an ideal reason for Barclays or City or any, you know, Delta, anybody who's looking at applying blockchain technology, they're most likely going to want to apply it in a side chain so that they can be interoperable with Bitcoin. Right. Because I, I've heard it described Bitcoin's the worldwide ledger. And so anywhere we have a ledger, and I, I like to call it a triple entry bookkeeping system. So anywhere we have a ledger and we need to do bookkeeping or accounting, whether that's the title to a house or a car or a yacht or shares of stock or how many frequent flyer points we have or royalties for music, like whatever it is that we need a ledger, we can build side chains that are then interoperable for all of these different applications of ledgers. Yeah. Is, is the, is what you see happening with this. Right. So, I mean, I think there's every reason to do that, you know, so, I mean, right now, many, uh, the financial institutions and fintech players that are looking at blockchain technology. They're, you know, they start, they're largely at the starting point of trying out the technology to understand it or doing trial runs or trying, trying it out with specific markets. But the financial network is very interconnected, as I mentioned. So, you know, once, once it's running and other people are running the same technology stack, they will want to be able to transfer their products and sell them to other institutions that are going to resell them or package them. Or well use them as products. collateral. Exactly. Or want to suspend them and pay them out as an annuity or, I mean, right. you got all these different potential right. uses. And so another thing to say is that potentially, you know, a sidechain can be, you can make a private sidechain between a group of trading parties, or you can also have a public sidechain. And within the public sidechain, you can have a sort of virtual private sidechain in the sense that the much of the data in there, you know, the blockchain is only about pr proving the integrity of the financial transactions. And it doesn't necessarily reveal the terms of the smart contract, the values exchanged, what shares are changed hands even. It's just providing a kind of cryptographic trust assurance between ledgers. So people shouldn't feel too concerned that, um, this technology is going to kind of dump all their information out onto the main blockchain. I know Bitcoin has some of those properties, but new technologies are coming online with confidential transactions that provide a more of a kind of virtual private chain model. And so in that model, it's also interesting that, you know, you can have different issuers. So you mentioned a rewards program, you know, so there's no inherent reason that the rewards program issuer can't be an issuer of their rewards points onto the side chain and uh, another hotel chain or airline can issue points on the same chain. It, the chain supports user defined assets and users can be, you know, different hotel chains or airlines or loyalty points or shares. So basically many things can fit on the chain and the only real sort of technology push to start a new chain is generally, you know, to, to add a new feature that's specialized to a particular type of market. So, you know, if there's something that's about high frequency trade, maybe it makes some trade offs and, is focused on that type of application, but things within the same kind of that can that can work with the same smart contracting and latency and so forth characteristics can just as easily exist on the same side chain. Or if people prefer, they can you know make an isolated side chain and it can still connect and the assets can be transferred between side chains. I think you know the reason to have things on the same side chain is you can directly write a smart contract between them. Whereas if you want to write a smart contract with an asset that's on a different chain, you have to bring it to the same chain. So the contracts are expressed within assets on a chain and you can move things there. So anyway, it provides a kind of standardized interoperability layer. It doesn't really constrain people because they can potentially 
pick up a, a sidechain implementation from a different company, or they can write one themselves, or they can extend one or pay somebody to extend one for them. So there's not really that much constraint in what they're doing. It's just a kind of internet working interoperability layer. You know, if you go back to the internet analogy, if, if every internet service provider and every big business was using a different network stack and you couldn't connect to them, the world would be a much poorer place. So we want to see that kind of interoperability. And it's really essential, essential that the trust mechanism is transferable. Otherwise, we lose the kind of big value of the blockchains. Yeah, it's kind of like the LAMP stack. You know, everybody uses Linux and Apache. And so it's when we're dealing with the actual development of the core Bitcoin protocol, how how does how do these side chains help with that? It we we can roll out a new feature instead of doing a hard fork. We can battle test it, and if it uh, doesn't have any critical flaws, what, what do we do? Just merge it back into the core protocol? Or? Yeah, I mean, so several of the, I mean, on on the alpha side chain, we implemented a number of elements, as they're called, and some of those are candidates for merging back into Bitcoin because they're soft forkable or they they. It's it's generally more complicated to package a change as a soft fork change for Bitcoin because there's a kind of you know the backwards compatibility mechanism has its own complexities and takes this period of time to apply. But nevertheless, some of those features have now been proven. For example, Schnorr signatures, which make more efficient use of uh, blockchain space, and Dr. Peter Roller was able to construct a a more efficient multi-sig called tree-sig that he presented at the San Francisco Bitcoin conference last week. And so we can basically enable much more complicated bank mandate multi-signature scenarios and make much more efficient use of blockchain space using those. And so that kind of thing could actually be merged with Bitcoin. And so does that help increase Bitcoin's uh, scalability or its throughput or both? Uh, it does, it does increase its throughput a little potentially because, you know, we're, we're seeing more widespread adoption of uh, multi-sig now and the Bitcoin form of multi-sig, it does, does make the average transaction size, you know, maybe two or three times larger. And so to the extent that the Schnorr multi-sig, you know, a three of three Schnorr multi-sig is the same size as a single uh, Bitcoin signature transaction. And some of the other variants are also uh, basically all variants of multi-sig are more compact using this technology. So it reclaims some of the throughput. Are there any uh, increased privacy benefits uh, associated with the multi-sig? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's maybe not so well understood, but um, the smart contracting feature of Bitcoin, you can uh, engage in a private smart contract. So you can you can encode a smart contract as a P2SH where the chain only sees the hash of the contract. And if you structure your overall contract as the two parties to the contract, so you know if I, Adam engage in a smart contract with Trace, uh, which is, you know, some kind of derivative. And based on the market conditions, let's say Trace is the beneficiary because, you know, it worked out in his favor. Now, the smart contract gives the exact details, but the blockchain doesn't really need to see that. As long as myself and Trace sign the multi-sig, so it will say, you know, Adam and Trace sign or whatever this smart contract decrees. Now, we can see which way the smart contract goes. And so there's no reason for us to present the proof and arbitrate on the blockchain because we know the outcome. So we just as well sign the multi-sig and that preserves the privacy of the contract details. And it saves blockchain space because to present the smart contract to the blockchain takes space. You have to actually present the program where the hash of the program is much smaller. So I, c- I could well imagine that many smart contracts would operate in that way where there's actually, you know, no need to present the terms of the smart contract. That's just a kind of arbitration. And there's no need to test the terms of the arbitration because it's perfectly predictable. We, we know up front which way this contract played out. So there's no incentive for us to contest it on the blockchain. What about uh, being able to prove or disprove who the actual signers were in a, in one of these multi-sig transactions? Is there any way to have optionality with that? Yeah, so that's one of the properties of a multi-sig, whether, whether you have an audit trail to see which, you know, if there's a two of three to see which two signed. And that's an optional feature. You know, if you, the tree sig, multi sig that's uh, sort of compact that Peter Willer presented um, preserves that property. So you can still see who signed. You can just represent that more compactly. And, and it's optional. So you, yes. you can see or you, you can choose not to be able to see. Right. So if, in particular, if you go for the sort of three of three, well, let me see. 
Uh, there, there are some models where you can make something even more compact and not necessarily be able to see who signed. But generally, there is uh, authorization information. And another detail is that, that that is kind of considered to be an audit log. And the outcome of the transaction is what's important, which is, okay, was it authorized and who received the money? But the information about the actual signature serialization and who signed can be considered a separate audit trail. And so another thing we observed in in a sidechain alpha is that you can do, we call it segregated witness, which is the witness is a cryptographic term, meaning the proof. And so we noticed that you can separate it. And actually, this is a kind of robust fix for transaction malleability is related to this, which is another factor that Bitcoin is still working on fixing. That the, if you, if you apply this on the blockchain, about two thirds of the blockchain traffic are related to audit information and about one third related to the outcome. So, you know, if you applied this and then you want to sync up a new node, you don't actually need all that audit information. So you could sync up a node about three times faster with current blockchain characteristics. So that's something the sync time to catch up a full node is another kind of usability characteristic of blockchain to improve its performance generally. That's very interesting. I was just thinking of this in context of in episode three where we were talking about the confidential transactions and we uh, got a little distracted into ring signatures and a coin join and, you know, some of these applications with multi-sig to, you know, provide increased plausible deniability and and other features that could help uh, make a company's security profile less obvious to Mm -hmm. any observers of the blockchain, for example. But yeah, to get, to get back on point with side chains, do you consider this one of the major innovations uh, that's going to be happening in this blockchain technology space? Before I, you know, when I started in Bitcoin, I was interested in confidential transactions and just generally improving fungibility in Bitcoin and adding, you know, extending it in interesting ways. And then I ran into the problem about extensibility. And so once Greg Maxwell and I had found a way to do it with sidechains, we became pretty convinced that this is actually the most important thing to work on. And that's, you know, that that became our focus from that point because we thought that was the most important thing to advance Bitcoin and to enable Bitcoin to innovate and grow in the use cases that the technology can provide. And so that's why we founded Blockstream to develop that technology. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking this great amount of time. We've done five packed episodes. Uh, This has been episode five, where we've discussed your brainchild on sidechains, one of the most uh, fundamentally innovative parts of Bitcoin that will enable its extensibility. Uh, For this series, we've had Dr. Adam Back, the legendary, (laughs) and Thanks so much for everything you've done with Bitcoin and for the uh, tremendous intellectual leadership you've provided in this field with us. So thanks for being on the podcast with us, Dr. Back. Thank you. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.